Listen, if you are in a moment where you know there's something God is calling you to do, when you're in a moment where you know there's something difficult for you to accomplish, and you say, well, I'm afraid to, to do this, I'm afraid to do that, and all the what ifs start piling up on you. What if they say this? What if they say that? What if they do this? And all those what ifs start piling up. I'm encouraging you to do it afraid. Step out and do it afraid. I'm telling you right now, if you find yourself in that moment where you're afraid to live out God's will, do it afraid. Don't let the enemy convince you to stay in your place and don't do anything. As we read the word of God, I'm excited to see what the Lord is going to do this morning. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord. We honor you and we praise you. Right now, God, in this moment, nothing else matters. We desire to hear clearly from you, Lord God. I pray that it is not me that they hear, O oh God, but it is you, Heavenly Father God, you that they hear through me. So, Father, in the matchless name of Jesus, I pray that they are engaged by this word, equipped by this word, empowered by this word, encouraged by this word to do your will on this earth. Father, you are that you are. Have thine own way. Help me to declare publicly, O oh God, what you've given me in our secret place. It is in Jesus' matchless name we pray. And everyone said, Amen, amen, amen. If we could remain standing for the reading of, of the word. And it says this, For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. Or in the New King James, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a what? A sound mind. You may be seated in his presence. Amen. I want to get into this today. Uh, 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 if you are taking notes, y'all know, as I always say, I do encourage you to take notes. The, the word for today, this morning, is entitled Afraid. Afraid. I want to I wanna help break some things down. There's a particular part in this message that I'm really excited about. I was looking over my notes, and I kind of want to hurry up and get to the end. So if I start rushing, babe, just look at me and say, take your, take your time, because I just want to get this something I discovered at the end uh, and what takes place at the, at the tomb of Jesus that I just think is so beautiful. But we'll get there. We'll get there. For now, I just want to describe a moment. Shout out to my brothers in the house. He's going to laugh when I tell this story. I, when, when my brother and I were, were young, I think maybe like 10, 11, 12, 13, uh, we would go to a, a neighborhood basketball park. And this basketball park was, was not, not too far from the house, but it was a little bit of a walk. And we just loved to play basketball. So after school, we would, we would you know, kind of do our homework, and then we would get some snacks, and then we would head off to the park. Now, here's the thing that sounds innocent enough, but for some odd reason, I cannot figure this out for the life of me, but every single time we would go to the park, I'll say about 99.9% .9 of the time, we would go to the park, we would get, a lot of times, not on the way to the park, but after playing basketball for hours and hours, we would be walking back home, and without a shadow of a doubt, we would get chased by a bloodthirsty dog. Every single, now here's the crazy part. It was not often the same dog. And I'm not talking about little chihuahuas. I'm talking huge, and you name it, Doberman Pinschers, German Shepherds. Remember that boxer we used to? It was a boxer with Rottweilers. It's like how many vicious dogs do y'all have in this neighborhood that are loose nonetheless? And so we would walk, and, and I remember every time, we, in fact, almost to this day when I go for a walk, I walk like, it sounds crazy, but if it's not a very uh, a busy street, I'll walk towards the middle of the street just in case a dog is running from somebody's backyard into the street. I got a little head start because he's got to clear, clear the front yard first. And so I remember running side by side 
with my brother on our way home, dog tired, and I'm running with everything I have, and I'm thinking that I, because my adrenaline is pumping, I'm thinking this dog is a million miles behind me as fast as I'm running, and I took a glimpse back, and this dog is drooling, his teeth are coming, and, and, and I, he's gaining on me. I remember get this dog getting so close to me, I was running, and, and, and as my foot is coming up, I'm kicking him in, in, in his mouth. He's that close trying to nibble on my ankles and running, and it must have been a territorial thing, because once we turn that corner on, on Grand Avenue, they just stop, they stop chasing us. But this would happen over and over. And let me tell you, I saw my brother completely jump on the, not on the, uh, the hood of a car, on the roof of the car in a single bound. <laughs> That's adrenaline is pumping. One time he kicked the dog. He, we were so tired. I, I digress. But we were so tired one time. My brother, I'm taking off running. My brother just sitting there like this. And I'm like, this man must have some kind of suicide wish. The dog comes close and he just, he booted that dog so hard. We just got so tired of running. What's the point? Why am I sharing this childhood story? Let me tell you something. When we were running, we were afraid. We were, it is no doubt about it. It doesn't matter. I don't care how you try to convince me of it. We were afraid. Nervous, we were afraid. Literally, at that moment, running for our lives. Listen, if we're honest for our set, with ourselves, we know that we all experience being afraid in this life. We've all experienced it. At some point in your life, you've experienced that moment where your, your heart is beating out of your chest and you're, and you're afraid. You've got butterflies in your stomach. You are afraid. It doesn't matter how strong or how brave you are. I see you, sister girl. I know you bad, but you know that you have had moments where you were afraid. I see you, man of God. I know you're a mighty man of valor, but if you're real with yourself, you'll admit you at home, you'll admit that you have had moments where you were afraid. Maybe, maybe for you it wasn't vicious hellhounds chasing you down after you left the park like it was for me. But maybe it was something else. Maybe it was something you experienced. In your everyday, in your everyday life, maybe, maybe it was a time you were, you were in the waiting room and you were waiting for the doctor to come in and tell you your test results. Maybe, maybe it was that phone call that you got before you went into the doctor that said, hey, we need you to come in. We need to speak with you. If you're honest with yourself, you had a moment where your heart is beating out of your chest and you were, you were afraid. Maybe, maybe it was when you were waiting, waiting in, 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 the, in the office to get called for that job interview that you had been hoping for, that you had been preparing for, that you had been thinking about all month, and you're sitting there and you start to scout all the other possible potential hires, and you start comparing yourself to them and wondering what degrees they have and what qualifications they have, and suddenly you start to, you start to feel a little bit afraid because your time is coming. If you're honest with yourself, we've all, we've all had those we had those moments. Today, God wants us to explore all that is taking place when we're afraid and how we are called to deal with being afraid as a child of God. How we are called to deal with being afraid as a child of God. Listen, if I told you I had a humongous, like I wanted to do an object lesson today, and I told you I had a gigantic Australian gator in the chapel right now. And then y'all laugh, so, oh, Pastor Jason, he's so crazy. And then I opened the door and a gator came out and started rushing towards y'all. I'm telling you right now, you would be a fool to stand there and say, well, God has not given me the spirit of fear, <laughs> but of love, of power, and a sound mind. Yeah. Hallelujah. You will get your behind chewed it doesn't make any sense. In fact, you will be right to get back in your chair, to grab your child, husbands, grab your wives. Oh, my God, Pastor Jason's lost his mind and head for the door. That makes sense. It's like Pastor Kears just said, don't leave your head off to the, on your side chair. You have to think. You have to think. This is the reality. In the moment, if I were to open that door and an alligator came in to this sanctuary, you better believe you would have a moment of sheer fright. You would have a sheer fright, and that fear wouldn't just, wouldn't just keep you in your chair, but you would begin heading for the door. That is just the reality that, that we face here. So, so what, 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 am I, what am I saying to you? It, it, it's this. How can it be that you can be saved, 
sanctified and filled with the Holy Spirit and still find yourself in a situation where you are scared? How, how, how can it be? How can it, how can it be that, that all of these things are happening? How can it be that all these things are, are happening and, and, it's, and you find yourself fearful? The reality is some types of fear, stay with me now, some types of fear are of God. Some types of fear are of God. This begs a few questions. Why would God ever want me to be afraid? Why would God ever want me to be afraid? Stay with me. Why would God ever want me to be afraid? And why would God tell me he hasn't given me a spirit of fear that in reality I experience all the time? Is there something wrong with me? How can it be that I'm saved and sanctified and yet and still I experience moments of fear all the time? Is there something wrong with me? God, if there is, uproot it in, inside of me. Am I demonically possessed if you're real with yourself? Sometimes you think all of these questions as you experience very various levels of being afraid throughout your life life throughout your life the truth is there are different types of fear somebody say that with me there are different types of fear because I don't want you to misunderstand what I'm saying there are different types of fear some are healthy fears and others should be conquered and rebuked at all costs they should be conquered and rebuked at all costs so he, he, here's the I'll give you an example God has given us common sense, the example that I just gave you, if a crocodile came into this room, you would experience a moment of fear for your life. If you don't run, something's going to happen, and so you begin to head for the exit. That is a, a what is called fight. We heard about this in school. Fight or flight. Guess what? God gave you that. He wired that within you on the inside of you to give you a, a sense that you need to preserve your life. If there's a danger afoot, guess what? I still have a plan and a purpose for you. I don't want you to stand there while a hungry gator is running towards you talking about God. That's not giving me the spirit of fear. No, he gave you common sense to either fight or to run to preserve your life. That's just, that's just the reality. That's a a good sense of fear. That's a common sense kind of, of, of fear. Fear when there is something that is trying to take away our lives, a wild animal, someone running towards you with a gun. That fear causes you to spring into action and run in the opposite direction. However, there are other types of, of good fears, other types of good fears, such as the fear of your parents. Hallelujah. The fear of your parents. And I'm not telling you that you ought to be scared of your parents. And there's this, this is kind of a, a ruling with an iron thumb, authoritative, abusive kind of kind of power that leads to fear. But I'm talking about I better not open my mouth like that. Matter of fact, I better not think about opening my mouth like that to my mother or my father because there will be consequences and repercussions. I'm not going to because now it's, it's a fear that is birthed out of respect and out of reverence. That's a healthy fear. Are y'all with me this morning? That's a healthy, a healthy fear. And so there's also a, a bad fear. Fear. Well, I want to continue with the good fears. There's also, there's that the fight or flight, there's the fear of parents, and then there's also, guess what? The very fear of God. Let me explain something to you right now. Jesus is not your homeboy. <laughs> I hated those shirts when they were out, and Jesus is like, like, what is that? Jesus is not your homeboy, and God is not your friend. Oh, Jesus, help me preach this word. He, you are, you are, God, God calls you friend. But you are not to call him friend. Here's, here's why I'm explaining this to you. Because I, I've seen how some of y'all treat your friends. Come on, come on, come on, come on. The reality is your friend has no authority over you. The minute you call somebody your friend, you are e at equal levels. This is why it's difficult to start a business with your friends when you are the CEO and they are your subordinate. Because the minute you start to tell them what they need to do, they look at you like a friend looks like, who do you think you are? <laughs> And things get difficult, right? And so God is saying, I, I, am not, I am not calling you to call me friend. I'm calling you friend. And I'm only calling you friend in so as much as this, to let you know that just like a friend, I don't keep any secrets from you. 
Just like a friend, I'm telling you about all the, all the secrets, all the deep things of, of me, all the deep things in Scripture. I'm making them known to you. I'm not keeping any secrets from you. And so in that way, I call you friend. But don't get cute and call me friend and treat me like you do the rest of your other friends. They call, you don't pick up. <laughs> you start breaking commitments. You said you'd be there. You ain't there. But they're your friends, so they'll understand. God says, no, 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 that's, that's, not, that's, not, that's not what I want for you. And so, and so there is a healthy fear. When you recognize God as Elohim, as you, as you recognize him as most high, all-powerful, God of the universe, he who speaks and things come into existence, the giver of life, the bread of life, the great I am. When you recognize him as that, you come always come to God with a sense of reverence. And also with an understanding and in all of his power, God is amazing and mighty, and he's a no-nonsense, all-perfect and righteous God. God of grace, but a no-nonsense God. And so you recognize it when, when, you start, when you start feeling like you want to say anything to God or come any old kind of way and be, and be lax or, or disrespectful in his presence. There's a part of you that says, you better watch your mouth in this place. You better watch your mouth in his presence. You better straighten up. I'm thinking of Mr. Fritz, straighten up and fly right. You better get it together for God is to be revered. He is a God of power. He's a God of power. And so there's a healthy fear of God. Y'all still with me this morning? Now, now, there are also bad fears. There's bad fears. And here's one, fear of God's will for your life. That's a bad fear. I'm afraid of what God wants to do in me. I'm not, I'm not afraid of failure. I'm afraid of success. I'm afraid of, of when I say yes, what, what God is going to do to and through me. I'm, a, I'm afraid of where he's going to send me. I'm, I'm afraid. And so as a result, you find yourself paralyzed when it comes to his will for your life. There's a bad fear. There's an a, a, a unhealthy fear of rejection from this world. Some people are afraid of being rejected by people who don't know Christ, afraid of being rejected by those that are in the world and, and those who, who go by the world standards. You're afraid of being rejected by them, and so you do different things to, to hide your Christianity. There is an unhealthy fear of being rejected by this world. 2 Timothy 1, 7, our opening scripture says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love in a sound mind. It's important that we understand that the spirit of fear that God is talking about is not talking about the fear of a roaring lion that comes into the sanctuary and you've got to run for your life. That's just common sense. Run for your life unless you get eaten. It's not talking about that. This fear that God is talking about, it, it, it's the fear that comes as a result of persecution. Christian persecution. Don't be afraid of people that will persecute you because of your belief in Jesus. Don't be afraid of those who are going to reject you because of your faith in, in Jesus. And also this, don't be afraid that when if somebody gets up and they start talking and, and bending and, and shifting around scripture to make it sound good to you and to tickle your eardrums, don't be afraid to get up afterwards and say, man, the God, you know I respect you, but what you just said was wrong. You're twisting up scripture to make it sound like you want it to sound like you're twisting up scripture because you want folks to run around your building and not notice that you are preaching anything of real substance the word of God is saying don't be afraid to say something when somebody manipulates the word of God for their own personal agenda. And so this is what 2 Timothy 1.7 is talking about. That's the, the really unhealthy fear that God is addressing here. Don't be afraid of those who may be able to destroy your body but can do nothing to your soul. Amen. Don't be afraid of being rejected by people who in the end don't matter. And don't be afraid to call somebody out when they misquote a scripture for their own personal, personal gain. God makes a specific point to highlight the fear in this scripture because he wants us to understand that the time will come. I'm not telling you that it might come. I'm telling you the time will come. 
and I dare say is a whole lot closer today than it even was yesterday. But the time will come where you will face persecution because of your love for Jesus. Folks, the time is here that when you speak about the love of God and the love of Jesus and you begin to present a holy standard that people will tell you that you're preaching hate when in fact you're preaching love. And don't be afraid in that moment when they call you, when they try to reverse your love and, and call it hate. Don't be afraid to stop speaking. Don't stop speaking in that moment. You have to continue to love people to the cross, but don't allow them to shut your mouth. We just sang about it just a moment ago. As long as I'm breathing, I will always, I'll always worship you. I'll always worship you. This is the reality. Don't be afraid in those moments. The time will come when you need to to stand up and tell the truth in less than ideal situations and not be afraid because the kingdom of God is at hand. His Holy Spirit has created a deposit of boldness in you that will rise up in that moment of persecution. Some of you are in this room right now when you're thinking to yourself, man, in that moment, if I ever had to face persecution, I don't know, I would be so afraid. I'm telling you in that moment because of his Holy Spirit presence in your life. In that moment, that you, you will recognize that that spear is driven out. Something His Holy Spirit will just overcome you, and you'll be able to stand. The Christ in you will be able to stand in that moment where everyone else will flee. This is why I tell you, I get afraid. I get, I get, I get a little antsy around happy Christians. Because like we said, bad things can make you happy. And they want to be happy and have their, their ears tickled. But when the persecution comes, happy Christians aren't happy anymore. Yeah, yeah. And they will leave you where you stand. I'm looking for it. And God, forget me, God is looking for Christians that are filled with the joy of the Lord and the boldness of his Holy Spirit to stand come hell or high water. God has not given you the spirit of fear. And so this is the kind of unhealthy fear that, that God is talking about in 2 Timothy 1 and, and 7. The kingdom, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. I want to read you a quick scripture. Revelations chapter 19, yeah. verse 11. I love one of my, I always say this is my favorite scripture. All the scriptures is my favorite scripture, but this is one of my favorite scriptures for real. It says, now I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he judges and he makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire. And on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Watch this. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Why am I reading you this scripture as it, as it pertains to being afraid? I'm telling you right now, I don't know about you, but I'm going to be there riding with Jesus when all is said and done. I'm determined to be a part of that army that scripture is talking about. Now let me tell you this here. God is not going to have no afraid folk in his army. He's not going to have any folks that are afraid of the persecutions that may or may not come. In fact, these are the, the, a good majority of these folks that are in this army are those who died as a result of persecution. And so God is not going to call any afraid, scared folk to be a part of his army. He's calling those who do not have that spirit of fear because of the Holy Spirit that dwells on the inside. The scared are not going to be on that, on that ride. Yeah. Now, I want to say this quick, and then I'm going to wrap up. The, the, the enemy, he doesn't want you aware of the fact that God has given us healthy fears that are meant to prod us forward, to protect us, to give us common sense, to preserve our, our, our lives, and to pull us closer to God and his will. Instead, he wants to mess with your understanding of fear, and he wants to use it to paralyze you and cause you to make unhealthy decisions. 
He doesn't want you to understand, yes, there's a good and healthy fear of God, healthy fear of parents, healthy fear of a ravenous dog chasing you down. That's a healthy fear. It's a, it preserves your life in many ways. But there are also those negative fears that we just talked about. The enemy wants to lump it all in together and, and, and get you to, to a place where anytime you experience fear, it doesn't prod you into action. It paralyzes you in your place. And he wants to see you paralyzed. This is how you have somebody so anointed, has so much potential on the inside of them, and all they do is sit in Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, and they never serve, and they never walk out, and they never do anything, anything. How? Because they are paralyzed. The enemy has convinced them to be paralyzed in their fear, very actually scared of the very will of God. Anytime there's an opportunity to act on God's will, he throws a barrage of what ifs at you. A whole bunch of what ifs. Well, what if you get up and you say this? Or what if when you go to serve, this happens? Or what if when you join that ministry that you experience this, that, and the other? And the hopes that you'll just be paralyzed right there in, in, in your place. Listen, the, 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 the fact is fear of realized potential is what motivates him to make sure that you never act out on God's will. You see that the thing that a lot of people give the enemy credit for that they ought not to give him credit for is they start to, to be convinced that the enemy can tell your future. Like he knows your future. He, he, has, he, has, he knows your future and he has power over your future. No, the enemy doesn't know. Your, he knows that in the end you win if you abide in him, but he doesn't know the intricacies of God's will for your life. He doesn't know. But what he does know is your potential. What he does see inside of you is the ability that you have to be everything that God called you to be. And so as a result, his hope is that you never come to that place of realized potential. So he has to paralyze you with fear. Paralyze you with fear. Child of God, I want to tell you this morning that God's will for your life is so big and it's so multifaceted. It's so huge that it can be overwhelming and quite honestly scary. I'm telling you, if the me right now can go back and talk to the me 10 years ago, I would probably live it, be living somewhere in some far off distant land and y'all would never hear from me again because it's so big, it's so huge, and it's so scary, it will blow my mind. And so, but I get to a point where, where I realize man how do you walk on water God if you call me out I'll take one step and I'll put it in front of the other there's a song that says that and it reminds me that it's so it's so true but the reality his will is so huge and it's so big and it's so multifaceted why does his will have to be so scary why does this will have to be so huge? Why can't I just have something simple like can't I just help old ladies across the street and call it a day Maybe that is it. I don't know. But the reality is this. God's will is so big and so huge for your life and so multifaceted and so difficult to accomplish because it causes you to continuously lean on him in order for it to be done. I tell staff all the time, when we talk about COTR Global, I say this all the time, listen, I cannot do it. In fact, I'm so excited about COTR Global because it helps me to recognize this reality. If I can do it by myself, God isn't in it. If it ain't, I've gotten to this point, I'm still testing this one out, but if it's not scary, if it doesn't challenge me to go beyond myself and my life is shown, God probably isn't, it isn't, he isn't in it. God wants to make his, his will for your life so challenging and, and not, not difficult, but so big and so seemingly insurmountable that it causes you to, one, be humble and lean on him and check on other people who, where you are, are weak, they're strong, where they're, where they're weak, you're strong, and lean on each other to move forward. This is the essence of all in Church on the Rock because I'm telling you, you can't do it by yourself. You've already proven yourself that. I can't do it by myself. I've proven that to myself many times, but when we come together, all locked in to do God's will on this earth, I'm telling you, we just can't lose we can't lose and so the reality is it's natural to be a little nervous when you start to think about God's will for your life but don't let that nervousness paralyze you don't let that nervousness paralyze you that's what the enemy that's what the enemy wants to 
wants to do. And so I want to say to you this morning, I, I think my, my sister uh, Joyce Meyer had a book on this, and it rings so true. haven't read it, but I know the title is, is so true. Listen, if you are in a moment where you know there's something God is calling you to do, when you're in a moment where you know there's something difficult for you to accomplish, and you're afraid, and, and you say, well, I'm afraid to, to do this, I'm afraid to do that, and what if, and all the what ifs start piling up on you. What if they say this? What if they say that? What if they do this? And all those what ifs start piling you. I'm encouraging you to do it afraid. Step out and do it afraid. I want to say this to you right now. When 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 Peter got out of the boat, I'm willing to bet he was he was probably a little bit nervous. He was probably a little bit scared. In fact, the scripture tells us when they saw Jesus afar off, they were what? They were afraid. But Peter stepped out of the boat and he put one foot in front of the other. I'm telling you right now, if you find yourself in that moment where you're afraid to live out God's will, do it afraid. Don't let the enemy convince you to stay in your place and don't do anything. Get married afraid. You got cold feet, but you know that this is the woman of God. God has called you to be. You be afraid and get married. God will deal with it. Go to the job interview. Nervous. It's all right. If it's God's will, God is calling you to move forward. Step out on his dream for your life. Don't be afraid of what's going to happen. Don't let that fear paralyze you, child of God. There is so much that he has for you. I'm telling you, sometimes all it takes is that first step in spite of your fear for God to part the waters for you. Take a step out and do what God is calling you to do. I want to read you the scripture and then we're out of here. Mark chapter 16, verse 1 through 8. And I just thought this was so beautiful. I hope y'all, I, I hope I can explain it right because it's beautiful to me. If y'all don't think this is beautiful, then I'll pray for you later. <laughs> Mark chapter 16, verse 1, it says, When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices to that, so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on, the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb. And they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, watch this, when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side. And what? They were what? They were alarmed. In other words, they were afraid. Don't be afraid, he said. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. Now watch this. But go Tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you, trembling and bewildered. Trembling and bewildered. In other words, what? Afraid. The women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Were they demonically possessed? Is there something wrong with these women? No, but yet and still they're afraid. What gives? The earliest manuscripts and some other ancient witnesses do not have uh, uh, nine, 9 through 20. So watch this. I want to go to, I wanna go to uh, um, the new, new King James. Actually, we'll stop right there. We'll stop right there. I'm sorry. Watch this. There's no doubt about it. No doubt about it that these women were afraid because they recognized that they had been, that had they been caught, they would be accused of having stolen the body of Jesus. 
And so there was a, a part of them that was afraid, a part of them that was nervous because if they were found, even though that they know that Jesus truly was who he said he was, that he was rejected, that he, that he was resurrected, that if they had been found, they would be accused of having stolen the body and having something to do with it, and then they would have dealt with the consequences thereof. And so as they leave the, 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 the tomb, they're afraid and they are, are trembling because of the possible accusations. And as followers of Jesus, they would have been persecuted and so they were concerned for their lives and so they're moving forward strategically trying to make sure that they live to tell the story that Jesus Christ had risen from the grave but there's another kind of beautiful fear that I want to talk about right now as we close this scripture suggests that they were afraid even before they went out to talk to the disciples if you notice, they mentioned the trembling that they experienced when they first walked into the tomb, and then they highlighted the trembling and the fear that they experienced when they ran out to tell the other disciples. So what gives with that first trembling and that fear when they walked into, into the tomb? I, I, I'd like to say this, that what I gather is that there's such a beautiful wonder in them being afraid in this moment. You see, they weren't afraid. They were afraid and they were overwhelmed from taking in all that this moment meant at once. I'll put it to you this way. I have married a couple of, or I have the pleasure of officiating many a wedding. And something that I like to do at the wedding is I'll speak to the groom, of course, but I'll also go into the quarters of the bride, make sure that she's okay, and, and I'll ask permission to speak with her, and I'll go in and I'll speak with her. And without a shadow of a doubt, every time I get the opportunity to speak with the bride, moments before her wedding, she's pacing as people are following behind her, making sure every hair is just so. She's pacing, and she's going back and forth, and she's breathing, and she's trembling. And she's not trembling because she feels like she's getting ready to make the biggest, biggest mistake of her life, at least 99% of the time. <laughs> she's not trembling because she feels like she's about to make the biggest mistake of her life. And, and I won't just put it on the bride, but, but also I've spoken to the grooms, and, and the grooms are they're, they're walking back and forth. The, the, the groom is walking back and forth, and he's trying to make sure everything is just so, and, and his heart is beating out of his chest. And he's, he's literally trembling. And so what is causing this, this future wife or this future husband to tremble the way they are trembling in such a beautiful moment such as this? The reality is this. In this moment, they're taking in. The, the magnitude of this moment, the, the finality of this moment, it's all hitting them all at once. And not only are they taking in the magnitude and the finality of this moment, but they're, but they're also realizing, oh my goodness, not only is this forever, but, but I'm looking forward to all that could be, all that I hope will be. Everything that I had hoped for and desired, I'm believing, is right there at the altar. And this moment is all swirling around as a ball of emotion on the inside of them. And so as a result, they are, they are there and they are trembling. And so I suggest to you this morning, and I want you to stand to your feet. I'm going to end with this. I suggest to you this morning that as these Marys, as they went inside of that tomb, they came and they were nervous and they were trembling. Not only because they were trying to move forward strategically and not get killed so that they could tell the good news of Jesus Christ, but in that moment, just like the bride, in that moment, just like the groom, they are taking in the gravity of this moment. And they're realizing what this means. This means everything I had hoped for. Everything that Jesus said would be. Everything as we know it. Just like the bride says, everything that I know is going to change right now the moment I become a wife. The same thing the, the groom is saying, everything, everything is going to change in this moment. The moment I say I do, everything changes. And so here you have Mary, and they're there, and they're trembling because in this moment they recognize because he is not here, everything, everything has changed. Everything that Jesus said would be, 
is going to be. Everything that Jesus said was going to take place is taking place. And so either they're not trembling because they're afraid, they're not trembling because they're, they're fearful, they're trembling because everything that is going to be is now official and is going to be. It's a beautiful moment where these women realize, because he is risen, I have life and it more abundantly. But you got to understand this. This is, the, this, is, this, is, this is change in the game in this moment. Up to this point, nobody knew for a Gentile. He didn't know what it meant to have life in it more abundantly. And so now, in this moment, I realize it's like the bride in her bridal quarters pacing the floor at the altar is everything I had hoped for and everything that is new for me is right there. And so this is why it makes sense when Jesus, when God calls us the bride and he's coming back to find us spotless and without blemish, it's a wonderful opportunity that we have to embrace the newness of his presence. Not trembling out of fear, but trembling because you know what is coming and the gravity and the weight and the amazement of what is still yet to come. So, child of God, I say this to you. In the moments where you experience any kind of fear, I want to say to you, do not let the enemy convince you to be paralyzed in your fear. There are good fears and there are bad fears. And if there's anything that is causing you to stay in your place right where you are and you know that it's God's will, I encourage you, do that thing afraid if you have to yeah. and watch yeah. God do yeah. what only he can do watch God do what only he can do I want to pray I want to pray this morning with every head bowed and with every eye closed father we thank you we thank you right now oh God for this moment for this moment that we have there's such a beautiful wonder for these women as they found themselves in the tomb. They were afraid and they were overwhelmed from taking in all that this moment meant all at once. In this moment, they realized everything that they had hoped for in Jesus and everything that Jesus had said was true. The world was flipped upside down in a good way, and it was officially time to embrace both an amazing change as well as the change of what it would cost to be a follower of Jesus. Your word says that they, they, fl they fled from the tomb for terror and amazement had seized them. Terror and amazement of all that this moment meant ball of excitement, of emotion, of nervousness, of hope, hope of glory, all rolling together in, the, in this moment. They fled for terror and amazement had seized them. Lord, the reality is there's so much amazement that you have for us in this life. Yeah, it's amazing, oh God, that we can be accepted, Lord Father God, into into your bosom when all is, is said and done. It's amazing, Lord God, that flawed human beings like us can come before a perfect God. It's amazing. And we tremble in your presence, not because, not, not only because we are fearful, not, of a, 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 not with a healthy fear, Lord God, but just with a reverence and also recognizing, oh, Father God, how amazing you truly are. And so today, oh God, I pray that we leave this place understanding, oh Father God, understanding, having a healthy understanding of fear, that it wouldn't paralyze us, but it would prod us to your glorious future for our lives. Have thine own way in the matchless name of Jesus, we pray. I just want to pray for anybody that's here in the house this morning and anybody that is at home. Maybe this morning you've been afraid, afraid of of, of dying, I'll tell you what, the, the reality is everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. But the truth is, the sting of death, or, or, or death sting, it kind of loses its power when you have the hope of glory. And maybe you're watching right now at home, or you're right here, and you, you are so deathly afraid 
of death. And death does have a sting because you can't say to yourself that if you died right now, you'd go to heaven. And so you live life afraid. There's a Savior for you. Yes, there's a Savior. His name is Jesus. And I don't care what the world tells you. I don't care what they try to convince you of. Without him, you will die and you will go to hell. I say that because I love you and I don't want that for you. Forget me, the Lord doesn't want that for you. And so right now you have the opportunity to escape the consequences that sin has caused and be cleansed in his righteous blood and receive him as Lord and Savior. And so with every head bowed and with every eye closed, if you're here this morning and you're saying to yourself, yeah, that's me, I need Jesus. I need Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Can you just wave at me and say, Pastor, you were talking to me all day. That's me, that's me. It's me, oh Lord. Give you just another moment. Maybe you're there at home right now. And you're saying to yourself, I need this Jesus. Well, you're just one prayer away from forgiveness and from taking the opportunity to repent and accepting him as Lord and Savior. So I just want you to pray after me. We're all going to pray this together in the house this morning. Just repeat after me. Say, Father, here I am, Lord. I thank you for this opportunity to run to your righteous, outstretched hand. Lord, you are a loving Father. And you have closed the gap that sin has caused. And so right now, because of your sacrifice, I come to you boldly to your throne of grace to obtain mercy. Lord, I repent of all of my sin. Wash me now in your redeeming blood. Lord, I believe that you suffered, that you died and were buried. And on the third day, you rose again in fulfillment of the scriptures and are seated at the right hand of the Father, interceding for me. And you have given me the gift of your Holy Spirit to lead me, to guide me, to fill me, to empower me, to love me. I receive that gift. Fill me from the top of my head to the soles of my feet. Lord, on this day, you are mine. And finally, I am yours. Come on, somebody give the Lord a shout of praise this morning. Come on, hallelujah. Somebody give the Lord a shout of praise this morning. Come on, all you fear conquerors. Somebody give the Lord a shout of praise this morning. Not paralyzed by fear. Not paralyzed by fear. Hallelujah. God bless you, my family. I love you to life until I see you again. Love God. Love yourself. Love each other. sanctuary we did forget to announce this during service but um we have been blessed to be a blessing to our seniors if you are 60 ish and older um we have a uh, a box of food that